you've got mail. The biggest difference is is that those, those thresholds used to be about who actually reported spam. So like a human had to click the button that said spam. Now Google has a, and Gmail has a very, sus, very sophisticated AI driven suspected spam. You can actually get shut down and your deliverability can go to almost nothing. Even if no one has clicked spam, the, you know, the definition of what spam was has, is completely changed. How concerned should people be about this? Cause I can't imagine some of these web marketing firms are up for some of the challenges we're talking about. I mean, this is pretty sophisticated stuff. <laughs> Hold the line for another episode of Straight Fire VR. In this episode, we have a packed expert panel. Back on the podcast is Vistage's CEO and C-suite mentor, as well as COO at Cabins for You, Scott Bunce. Doubling up on our expert name, Scott, we have Scott C, an industry expert and current chief strategy officer at VTrips. Rounding out the panel, is hospitality product marketing and executive at vtrips as well as part-time professor at brown university amber carpenter our host steve milo the ceo and founder at vtrips has the topics in his scope steve ready fire thanks heather welcome to another episode of straight fire vr got a great panel uh today got a lot of things to talk about uh scott punts i um haven't talked to you for a couple months. You were cautiously optimistic when I last talked to you uh, that things might improve in 2024 because in 2023, they really started to deteriorate. Since then, um, Vacasa released their uh, 2023 fourth quarter earnings showing gross booking value down 19%, which is their version of RevPAR, which is incredible. But even more incredible was they wouldn't uh, provide guidance for their 2024 numbers because they said things were deteriorating so rapidly. And then uh, we had Jason Sprinkle on at the beginning of the year, um, and um, he said that occupancy was pacing at 10% below 2019 levels, which is not a good uh, sign at all. Uh so I'm I'm curious what you've been seeing in quarter one in terms of both advanced bookings and revenue. Um, are things as uh, gloomy for you as they are from uh, Bacasa and from um, from Key Data? Uh, no, but so no, uh, we've actually had a great first quarter, and I'm I determine that two ways. One is our spread between us and our competitive set from a paid occupancy, rev par, or uh, total uh, revenue side of things. It's been very good. And then the second thing would be to budget. So we've had a, a great first quarter, but with the way that Easter's falling in spring break, I'm now pessimistic about next month. I think next month is going to hurt. Uh, we, we didn't uh, foresee that when we put together our budget as clearly as we wanted to, but I think we're going to be so far ahead in our first quarter that we'll get through April, we'll be okay, and May, you know, maybe not so much, but June's looking up again. In June, July, uh, first half of August, those are the big months where we do well until we get to the fall weekend. So uh, I'm, I'm still optimistic, uh, but I'm buckling in for the pain of April. So you're you're basically mostly in the Gatlinburg market, is that correct? And and also I think Blue Ridge. Yeah, so uh, we're about 575 properties. Uh, Two thirds are in uh, Pigeon Forge, uh, Gatlinburg, Sevierville, and then we're now probably up to one third, up to one third uh, between Blue Ridge, LJ, and Big Canoe in Georgia. And then we just have a small uh, footprint in the Panhandle. And again, we're we're looking to acquire a company in the panhandle. Well, great. Uh, I'm sure you and Scott can have lunch or dinner together because Scott lives down there. So Scott, um, on the VTrip side, things in particular for Janu January and February weren't so great. March, uh, things have rebounded a little bit better, but we had some ski markets where there wasn't snow. We had Florida, which was unseasonably cold. Um, 
are you starting to see any light ahead of the tunnel or is it doom and gloom as as Jason Sprinkle was indicating in his uh, previous podcast a couple weeks ago? Well, I think, uh, again, like Scott uh, enumerated, is, is, you know, I judge that by a couple of different ways. We had a tough January and February based on our budget, budget being based on last year. Um, and so I think some of those things uh, didn't come out the way we had wanted them to. But if I look at how we performed to the markets um, and how we did uh, in, in our comparative sets in each one of those markets, I think we've done pretty well. We certainly, uh, uh, as you know, w one of our uh, main focuses was making sure our occupancy hit where it needed to be. And we took all the steps necessary to do that and build as many as those beds as we possibly could in each one of the markets. So I think from that standpoint, um, we made a lot of progress after January, February, and March has been much better in that. I agree with Scott that I think April is going to be an extremely tough month. I think with not only the changes with Easter and spring breaks, but uh, just a lot of other headwinds that are that are uh, coming at us from all different angles, both politically and certainly in a lot of our markets that we're in and what we're facing somewhat in Florida with some laws we're trying to make sure don't get signed. So there's a lot of activity around that that we've got to continue to fight. So, Amber, you're kind of on the front lines. Um, we obviously saw things relatively slow, at least for our company, in January and Feb, February for advanced bookings versus last year. But then March started to turn around. Um, where, where, you know, where's your outlook right now for summer? I actually feel good about summer, but I do think that it, we're going to have compression on ADRs to get there. Um, I think our rates are going to, you know, you're going to have to be competitive. I also think that last minute is going to continue to be um, a big part of the strategy to pick up all those last minute. I think people are trying to save money this year or, you know, personal budgets are tight. And so I think it's exactly what I um, predicted. If you remember, Steve, about March, I said, give the parents a few weeks before spring break is looming. And they look around and think about sitting in the house with their kids for nine days and they're going to book last minute. We saw that happening. I think a few weeks of summer with your kids driving you crazy. You know, I have five. I love them. But at some point I'm going to cave and be like, we have to get out of here because I can't, uh, you know, it gets old, right? So I think we're going to see those last minute summer vacations happen, but there's going to be a lot of pressure on price. And Amber, I mean, the key for last minute bookings is not just OTAs, but also the direct site. And mm -hmm. you've definitely been on the front of some issues of concern that we've been dealing, but one of them has been some recent changes at Google uh, with Chrome. And there was an article in Yahoo Finance on March 24th called Massive Changes Coming to Google Chrome Threaten to shape, Reshape the uh, Modern Internet. Um, how concerned are you about uh, our friends at Alphabet? I'm more concerned for the industry and people that don't realize the implications of what that article is saying is coming, but um, and a lot of this stems from privacy um, and the changes in the world of privacy. So, um, I think people are not realizing that, especially for your direct business, that if you don't know how to uh, make changes and those changes need to have happened now, like you already have to have had this plan in place, um, that shortly you're going to stop being able to track, um, you're going to get very little useful data any longer um, if you don't make a lot of changes now to right. track the ROI on your marketing efforts or your so ads could get completely shut down. Like it's, there's, there's, a it, yeah, it's a lot. It, it It's extraordinarily um, problematic for companies if they're dependent on direct marketing and they're not paying attention to these changes at Google um, because they could end up effectively in a black box situation if they're not paying attention to Google Chrome. And we know that some companies uh, may use a web marketing company uh, or the principals may be at a point where they've uh, delegated the website to, you know, some kids in the office. And if they're not paying attention to this, literally, I mean, they could not be ranked. Uh, as you say, their Google AdWords could be shut off. I mean, a lot of really bad things could happen from a direct standpoint. When you add that to the changes that have already rolled out with the with more coming in early April on Gmail um, and Yahoo, 
both your email marketing and your pay-per-click, your direct marketing, your referral marketing, everything, everything is changing underneath us. And Google doesn't have a playbook that says, these are the steps you can take to, um, to resolve this or you know, buffer yourself from these changes that we're making. And to be fair, they aren't making these arbitrarily. Like these are the results of government, including some domestically, it's not just Europe, uh, government privacy policy laws. Um, and consumers saying they wanted this, but um, so it's it's a massive change, and it's become even more technical to survive. So Scott, um, cabins for you, fortunately, has some resources, um, which were you know we're both fortunate that we're companies have enough large enough staff where we have some people. But how concerned are you with some of these things that are happening at Google? Because I know direct business is a big part of Cabins for You's success. It has been a big part of our success. Um, although we're trying to maximize OTAs the best that we can. And I think you and I have even talked about this, where if business is coming in through an OTA, we're going to remarket back to them and say, book direct and you're going to get a better deal. La da 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 da. Uh, we went through uh, a whole scenario, and I know we're going to compare uh, production on Verbo and Airbnb last year to this year. You know, we've it's it's really interesting because going through all of our competitive set, doing a fee analysis, doing a rate analysis, we found that we've probably underserved ourselves in not getting the right mix of rates and fees in the past. And we're really having a good first quarter based on those OTAs and how they're going forward. Now, we you're right, I, we have enough resources as far as our website, and we do probably more than other companies rely on direct uh, bookings, but we admittedly outsource our PPC uh, and we do use BizCore. We've been uh, communicating with BizCore they're certainly aware of the changes that are coming with Google. And, you know, what they're telling me is Google is just the last of all the other uh, platforms that are going into this privacy mode. They're telling us that they're prepared going forward. Now, I would like to believe them, but uh, who knows? I'm going to uh, save that for actually what, how well they perform going forward. But we are having a dialogue with them and trying to make sure that we're all prepared along the way. So Scott C, um, you um, obviously we we got to know each other when you were president of Southern, and then you joined the V Trips team, and you're now chief operating officer, and revenue is reporting into you. And share mix is something we've all talked about. Um, how surprised or interesting do you think some of the share shift uh, dynamics of Q1 are um, compared to where they were? even four years ago, let's say 2019, um, as compared to 2024? I mean, as far as the channel? Yeah. Mix? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, as you know, when we uh, when I was at Southern, one of the things we did is we only used Verbo outside of our direct business, and we kind of put all our eggs in that basket back then because we felt like they, um, they catered more to the vacation rental industry, and they were willing to work with us, so... You know, I had a hard time paying somebody else to bring people into, you know, into my um, my world, and they were making 13 to 15 percent off that. So we kind of only got in bed at the time with Verbo, and so they were a big player back then. They were the ones, you know, really catering to the vacation rental uh, business. And I would tell you, and certainly in the last year, and almost really two years, Verbo was just tanked. I mean, we've had many conversations, as you know, with them, and. You know, they went from, you know, our number one source outside of microsites and, and our direct business to like they they dropped off the map. I've seen Airbnb uh, certainly uh, uh, climb up the ladder pretty quickly, especially in the last year with some of the changes that they've made. Um, and actually booking.com, you know, in their last year uh, has made huge changes and we've seen a much bigger mix from what they're bringing to the table. And then it's uh, not surprisingly, I guess, that the other one that's suffering the most right now is Expedia. So between Expedia and Verbo, they're by far the two that have dropped off the most for us and, and, and you know, seeing those kind of uh, not work together. I think the biggest surprise that I really have for them is, you know, for at least the last year, I've heard nothing but how much they're integrated now and everything works together the same. And 
you know, they're doing all these things the same and they're absolutely not. I mean, I don't see the integration at all. Still seems very separate. Uh, every time we have converse, conversations, it's separate. It just seems they've really dropped off the map this year. And so uh, we've had to see some of our other ones kind of take some of that up. Um, so that, that's what I see today. So, so Amber, um, I think you remember how dominant Burba was in this space, Burba slash Homeway. Um, and it wasn't even long ago. So here's some numbers I pulled. Tell me if these shock you. I know nothing really shocks you at this point, but in uh, March 2022, uh, Verbo accounted for 84% of our OTA mix. Pretty pretty incredible. Of course, that's taking into effect that Southern was just on Verbo and, and quite a few other acquisition companies were initially just on Verbo. In uh, March 2023, uh, we were fully integrated at that point. They were 61% uh, Verbo OTA mix. And in 2024, March 2024, 46%, down 25% in one year. How, I mean, you've been in this industry a long time and Verbo was steady. How shocking is it to see these numbers just deteriorate like this? You know, I thought it was going, I'll be honest, I thought it was going to um, stabilize this year that the majority of the loss was going to be seen last year while they were going through all of their transitions. So I'll be honest, I think I'm shocked to see um, that it's continuing to drop 50% year over year. I mean, from each year that you just stated, that's 50%, right, each year. You know, I I think it also is um, a really it's really a disruptive change because if you look from an OTA perspective, it was the only OTA that we had that behaved most like our direct channel. So it used to book a lot of the larger properties, the longer stays, uh, they were very stable of the OTAs. It has the lowest um, cancellation rate. So I think losing it has a bigger impact. Um, even if you can grow the other channels, it actually is a pretty disruptive change overall. Yes, yeah, Scott Bunce. So um, we admittedly have challenges with Airbnb. However, um, certainly want to give them props or at least driving revenue. So uh, in March 2022, Airbnb was 8% of our OTA mix. In 2023, it was 20% of our OTA mix. And in 2024, it's 32% of our OTA mix. Are you seeing that kind of growth at Cabins for You, because, I mean, this came out of nowhere. I mean, we we initially kind of discounted Airbnb as a place for people that were booking urban or maybe on the West Coast. Now, it appears, at least from our numbers, they're booking cabins in Gatlinburg and Pigeon Forge. Yeah, no, they are. And I've, I've definitely seen the change as well. I think when we started, it was probably very similar to what you said, Steve, where uh, maybe 80% was Verbo. And today I just looked at the numbers year to date and we're at like 50, 50. So, uh, maybe not the exact swing that you have, but you know, 80, 20 to 50, 50 is still a huge swing. And I, you know, the things that I'm worried about is, you know, Verbo now wants to be the merchant of record. And that's, that certainly doesn't bring me any joy by any stretch. Right. And, and the, the changes that they're making are, are, are pretty frustrating, uh, but maybe they're trying to catch up to what Airbnb is doing to be consumer friendly, but they're certainly not being management company friendly. Right. So Scott C., um, we, we've talked about changes that are coming out of Verbo. So for sure, one of the changes was they increased subscription prices without uh, a whole lot of notice from $5.99 to $6.99. But worse, they have communicated to us that they're going to discontinue subscription. Uh, we were quote unquote grandfathered in. And so our larger properties, like, you know, um, Scott's company has a lot of large properties. Southern has a lot of large properties. Subscription made a big difference. We'll have no choice but to go to pay per booking. You want to explain how that works? And then also what Scott said about this merchant of record issue, which literally could dramatically alter people's um, cash cash flow yeah I, I, yeah we uh, as you know it was just a couple of weeks ago that uh, both uh, Expedia and Verbo came and uh, talked to us and 
they let us know that their intent was to move to a merchant of record, which uh, doesn't surprise me, but uh, you know that that brings up a lot of things that we've got to start to go back and make plans for. But even over that, and they did, you know, as you know, the one of the reasons that at Southern we went completely with them is because it was a subscription price, and at that time it was costing me four hundred dollars per unit. So from then to now, they've gone up, and what they try to do is try to raise that price enough that it doesn't matter which one you're on, and so they're going to eliminate that that subscription price. And it started, the original one was that it was based on uh, just your gross rents. Now the new one is it's going to be on your subtotal, which now is going to be including all your fees. So now they're trying to get a bigger piece of what is traditionally our, our numbers. So that's making it difficult on that. And they've also looked at, if you notice that they forced us to drop some of our cancellation policies. So another thing that now makes it not in parity with our direct business is you know, first the price is, is where it's going and what they're costing us there, but we also have to face different cancellation policies, which is, you know, hurts us on how much we've lost. So one of the things we were, uh, Amber and I were looking at yesterday was cancellations used to be in the eight to nine percent or now 14 and 15 percent with Verbo. So that's now starting to increase. And as you know, that causes all kinds of accounting issues. So I just can't imagine, you know, as you mentioned, you know, we, we at least have some means to try to get through this, but I'm thinking of a lot of other companies without that cash flow, if they become merchant in a record, I mean, I, I don't know what you do at that point. You just got to have a whole different system that you're looking at. So, so Amber, so the, the merchant of record is pretty significant because everyone understands that Airbnb is merchant of record. You get paid um, on day of arrival normally. Uh, Booking.com uh, shifted to merchant of record um, and they gave us an option, but basically the option was uh, be, let them be the merchant of record or dramatically decrease in the algorithm. Um, it looks like Verbo will do something of similar where they'll essentially say, look, to be merchant of record, you're going to be just much higher in the algorithm. And at the moment, a lot of this has to do with cash flow, right? They can make high returns on that cash flow. I think 8% of Airbnb's revenue is uh, based on the interest from billions and billions of dollars of float they hold. But at the end of the day, this is a dramatic shift for the industry. And I'm not sure, I haven't seen a whole lot of um, companies in social media talk about this. It seems like uh, people are completely unaware of this coming. Well, Steve, usually the loudest voice uh, when these things have come up in the past has been yours and you've been pretty quiet lately. So um, I think that that's part of the problem. But no, I actually, you know, uh, I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist. I don't think it's just about the money. I think that Airbnb is winning um, because they not only are the merchant of record, but it means that they hold the keys to the trust with the consumer. So whoever gets the money decides it, you know, what, how that guest uh, relationship and has the bond of the guest relationship. So with Airbnb, as we've seen, uh, when they want to change, if a customer gets their money back or um, they're very guest centric and VRBO, Verbo, sorry, I'm so old, I still can't used to calling it Verbo, um, which now they call themselves what, Verbex or something, Verbo Expedia. So I guess that change is coming too, but I think that what is actually happening is that the OTAs need and want that control of the consumer trust, because if you have the trust, then you win the dollar overall, um, if that makes any sense. And so I think they're also going to take a very guest centric stand where Verbo used to be the property manager centric OTA um, and Airbnb was, has always been guest centric. I think that it's going to be very hard to, um, we all need to focus on what our guest experience is and our policies. And it's going to be more about, you know, what your rate strategy is and what is your policy parity strategy, right? So OTAs, all of us are guilty of this, tend to have better cancellation policies than our own direct sites. You know, we don't have the tolerance for the risk. So what they're actually doing is in all of these changes, Steve is forcing us all to rate parity too. And nobody's talking about that or paying attention to it. Scott Bunce, um, are are you on Streamline? Is that the software system you're on? Yes. Does Streamline give you the option of providing just different cancellation plans with different pricing like hotels do? So in other words, where you go to book a hotel, you can pay a rate that's higher and get flexible cancellation 
or lower and get no uh, cancellation, no refund. Does that option apply on Streamline? I have to admit, I haven't explored it. So so I don't know the answer. So I know, Amber, that's something you're talking with TNS Track about, right? Because that's a real problem, right? <laughs> what Amber's describing is true, right? The OTAs have an advantage on the cancellation um, policies. We're kind of fit. We're kind of structured with one policy. We can't really manipulate it like hotels do where, you know, if you go to uh, Marriott or Hyatt or Hilton, you definitely can get the best price if you're willing to go with a non-refundable fee. I mean, no question about that. And and our hands have been tied, right, Amber? Absolutely. So it is on TNS's roadmap uh, this year to uh, solve this so that we can tie price. Basically, we got pricing plans, which is more than just the rate. It would be the rate, the guarantee policy, meaning deposit policy and the uh, cancellation policy as a plan and show multiple prices based on those plans. And so, you you know, we would be able to, I think that's the point at which we could have both, uh, you know, price uh, policy parity um, and, and compete better in that arena. But, um, it, you know, today it's, it, there's no real way to resolve this. I think no PMS that I know of has actually gone, uh, public with this functionality yet for vacation rentals. Scott Bunce, I'm curious because we keep reading headlines from Expedia that say they're finished with their integration and uh, now Peter Kern is stepping down and uh, Arian Gorin is going to be the new CEO at the end of May. And yet, at least from V-Trips, so maybe Cabins for You is different, we can't get our inventory from Verbo onto Expedia. We have to use a channel manager. Um, and and that is just a very inefficient model and, and partly why Expedia is so bad um, as a channel to run on. But maybe you have a different scenario because it's been very, very frustrating after eight years not to be able to get a Verbo inventory fully integrated onto Expedia. Yeah, it's it's clunky to say the least. And, you know, you, we've been promised this integration and, and how seamless is going to be. And And you have to chuckle to think that, hey, they're done with it. Well, I I think <laughs> I think they were done with their old leadership, and now they've got some new leadership that that might make it work behind the scenes. But no, it's it's far from seamless. So Scott, we we, we want to sprinkle some positivity here. It's been pretty negative. So one channel that has surprisingly been good, although it's still modest compared to the other two, is Booking. dot com. So I pulled our uh, 2022 numbers. Booking.com was 3% in March 2022, 8% in March 2023, and now 11% in 2024. Are you seeing some optimism with Booking.com because they are supplier friendly and they seem uh, willing and more, they, they want to communicate and, and work better with property managers than maybe some of the others? Yeah, um, yeah, they definitely have been. They they've been much more uh, consumer friendly and and property manager friendly. Uh, in the last year, I've seen quite a bit of change. Um, they've also they've got a genius program which we were in for a while. A lot of them dropped out. They changed criteria. Then this year, they've been able to get that settled. And actually, we're we're pretty much all of our properties are in there now, which gives a ten percent discount. Um, which has been very helpful. And we, we've seen that drive some of our results with booking.com over the last uh, month or so. So I think they have definitely uh, stepped up their game. Uh, I think they probably smell a little blood in the water right now uh, and uh, has made and have, have made some changes to make that a little more uh, compatible to what we are. And, and they're responding, right? Part of the issue is, you know, we reach out a lot to the other ones, we reach out to all of them and try to set up weekly or biweekly meetings and booking.com uh, has been, you know, right up front, they've also integrated with track first. So their first ones to get into our PMS. So we don't have a third party in the middle of it and another three and a half percent that comes out of our cost. So I think those things have really kind of put them in a better uh, position, uh, certainly today than they were. So Amber, um, we've talked about the channels. I guess we could talk more about them. Uh, but I want to go back to the direct marketing because I think that's the key for anybody who is having challenges um, meeting their numbers. And the problem with the direct uh, channels is, you know, you've got headwinds and more importantly, you have 
changes from Google, Yahoo, et cetera, that can really affect your business. So if you're not on top of this, you could have severe problems with your direct marketing. Now you alluded to one of them, which is changes at Gmail and Yahoo, um, basically um, increasing the threshold for spam. So it's it's a it, it it it's a dramatic change that could cause emails literally to not be delivered to Gmail or Yahoo or other type users. So on top of that, so they actually decreased the threshold by to a third of what it used to be. Um, they walked back a little bit from that of what their original thresholds were when they first came out that these changes were coming. But the biggest difference is, is that those thresholds, and I think this is the part that's getting missed, is those thresholds used to be about who actually reported spam. So like a human had to click the button that said spam. Now Google has a, and Gmail has a very, very sophisticated AI driven suspected spam. Um, and so that algorithm, which I think is, you know, in its infancy uh, is what I would call any of these AI algorithms right now. You can actually get shut down and your deliverability can go to almost nothing, even if no one has clicked spam, but their algorithm, their the suspected spam algorithm picks it up. So the you know the definition of what spam was has is completely changed they've also required um by april 1st that wherever you're sending email out of has to have a one click unsubscribe so in gmail now when you see, get an email in your inbox they highlight it in blue right next to the sender the unsub a one click unsubscribe so if you have uh so you're going to see your unsubscribe rates uh, increase if your messaging isn't relevant and segmented but also it means that let's say that you have different interest lists or like for us, Steve, where we have multiple brands, when Gmail does the unsubscribe, if it's one click, you're not unsubscribing, it has to globally unsubscribe. So they've, they've changed the ability to even really segment what unsubscribe means. So like the level of changes that have occurred is, is immense. Also, people don't um, realize this, but any of the suspected spam or spam complaints from Gmail they don't show up in Brevo or in um, MailChimp or any of those. So Google does not send that data to those third parties. The only way you can track what's going on with this to make sure you don't get shut down or try to be as proactive as possible is to set up Google Postmaster tools. So you would see all of your spam complaints for other channels in your email platform, but Google, you would actually see um, both the suspected spam and spam complaints uh, but obfuscated at the user level. Uh, you wouldn't see what users did it at in Postmaster tools. So again, just making everything more complicated. Uh, and it, I mean, the good effect is it's going to force marketers to up their game or your messages won't go to anybody. But it also means that you better be taking a look at what your database looks like right now and what your segmentation practices are. Because relevancy has always been important. Well, now it's going to be the death of your CRM if you don't if you don't go pay attention to this. So, so Amber, um, we won't say which company is, but we're using a, a pretty large company to deliver our emails and you determine they were not in compliance uh, with some of these changes. How shocked or surprised, or maybe the right word is angry, were you when you figured that out? I feel like I my blood pressure just went up because you alluded to this company's name, um, the one of the largest email providers in the world. Um, uh, I think angry isn't even the word. Word the level of um, irresponsibility and also they haven't resolved these issues, Steve. I've come up with workarounds uh, around it, but I think also. You know, it's just one of those things that I think all of these changes are now happening so rapidly that even the largest tech companies in the world are having a hard time keeping up. I mean, it's it's just so rapid and coming at us from every angle that it's, that article's title was right on. The world is changing and people don't realize it. Scott, um, I'm sure email is important to cabins for you. Um, not sure how much you've been following this, but I, I was pretty surprised when Amber brought it to my attention and, and then all the consequences that can occur if, if you're not able to get deliverability. 
it, it almost feels like a one-two punch, right? You know, we're, I think the big thing with the privacy change is uh, the cookies and how it relates to remarketing. Now, I'm not quite sure remarketing is where I would hang all of my hat on how to market the company, but let's face it, we use StayFi and we we capture emails and we're using emails on a regular basis. And and the feel is, is that if we're not selective, we're cutting our nose off to spite our face here. So Scott C., um, back in the Southern days, probably when you were more relaxed, uh, you were using a web marketing company. Uh, how, how concerned should people be about this? Because I can't imagine some of these web marketing firms are up for some of the challenges we're talking about. I mean, this is pretty sophisticated stuff. Again, I mean, I'm on LinkedIn and places like that a lot. I don't see people talking about this. I certainly didn't see any sessions at the VRMA Spring Forum on this. Um, how concerned should people be about this? Because, I mean, if you can't get your emails delivered, that, that's going to be a big hit on your direct business. Yeah, first, I want to thank you for getting uh, Amber riled up about this again, because then I have to hear about it for the rest of the day. But um, yeah, it's it's it, I'm totally shocked. Um, you know, I found out same time you did with uh, all the research she, she did. And just to listen, listen to, you know, as she alluded to, a, a very large, uh, very sophisticated, very well-respected company had no idea, still doesn't. And, 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 you know, one of the things that Amber's been trying to push them is they should alert all their other constituents of this issue. And I think they're reluctant because they don't have an answer for it, which scares me even more. And so I'm not sure. And I've, I've talked to a lot of other um, C-level people in our industry, and it's not well known. It's not known at all. It seems to still be a very well-kept secret for some reason, but it, it's happened to us a little bit. And the, as as more time goes by, I, you know, I talked to another person this morning that's running a business here on the Panhandle, and and they had the same thing where they shut down their email. So, and and the problem with me on that too is there's no remedy. They don't really give you a remedy to do, go do that. If we didn't have, you know, Amber on our side, I, I you know, I'm not sure what we would have done at that point either. She just, uh, you know, she's as you know, uh, she goes down those rabbit holes pretty quickly and won't stop until she figures it out, which is is great for us. Uh, it's a little hard to manage on my side, but the rest of it is great for, for everything else that we have. But yeah, I, I, I don't think people have woken up to this yet. It's going to be a huge surprise when they see this. So Amber, uh, Scott C. just complimented you. That was really nice. Um, so, sort of. <laughs> uh, Amber, you've been in the industry for a little while. How, how much concern should property managers have? Like I said, I just alluded to the fact I don't see a lot of this being posted on social media. Um, the VRMA uh, Spring Forum doesn't really have uh, anything regarding this. Um, they may not even understand what's going on on the education committee. Um, no one's talking about this. Yet, as Scott said, he's talking to property managers that have had their email shut off. We had one division uh, that you were able to resurrect. But, I mean, this is big time bad news. Um. You know, I, I actually, unfortunately, I feel like the opposite conversations are happening. I see a lot of people saying like, oh, I have this new product. It'll tell you your unknown customer's email addresses so you can contact them or, you know, put it into your marketing automation. And actually, that's about the worst thing that you could do right now. And I think a lot of people don't understand the implications of can spam compliance. I think a lot of people aren't talking about the fact that um, in the past, we were able to live in this very gray world where the difference between a transactional email and a commercial or marketing email was never defined by the government. Um, that was defined last year by the government in, in the fall. And nobody nobody's talking about it. And nobody understands that enforcing can spam compliance, which comes with massive fines, like $5,000 per email that gets sent out to somebody who feels that you're spamming them and can prove it. Um, it's the same thing with text messaging. I think a lot of the, the narrative in the industry is it's great. It'll drive so much revenue, but there actually is a lot of uh, laws um, behind doing any of these things that our PMSs aren't ready for, our marketing platforms aren't really ready for. And if you're unaware of the, the risk is massive to your entire brand, not just your uh, pocketbook, but for instance, in the suspected spam algorithms and, and 
uh, Scott with cabins for you. I don't know if, if you guys are aware of this, but like even the font size that you use in your emails is cha is flagging you for suspected spam if you don't know what those guidelines are. And they, they don't publish them readily. I mean, these are things like certain words are now flagging you for spam. Font sizes, colors, looking at um, your engagement rate. So here's a good, like this is, I'll give this free advice, even though both Scott and Steve said, I can't educate the industry on this. Um, uh, and I'm not, anyway, I was about to make a joke. I won't make it. Um, but I will say this, do not send informational emails without some kind of click action to your commercial email address or your commercial campaigns. Don't do it. Use your PMS to send that out. Um, because if you don't see click throughs, that's a spam uh, indicator. So e like even your content down to that, uh, people aren't talking about. And so it's a, it's a really uh, complicated convoluted world, but the remarketing itself that goes back to the Chrome changes that are coming um, and privacy, it's not, it, I will tell you almost every single property management site I've looked at is not ready and doesn't, and I can see your settings. Like I have a tool where I can see everybody's Google Analytics settings and their AdWords settings and nobody's ready. Nobody has caught on to these changes. It's terrifying. Scott Bunch, you've been pretty quiet. <laughs> it is uh, it is pretty alarming. I mean, uh, Amber has gone and provided me commentary on a couple of the larger companies that have had some pretty strong financing and uh, based on the tools, they're not ready. Um I mean, partly, you know, obviously your shoes are, you're, you're a bigger company, but how are these smaller companies going to be able to do this? I mean, you've met some of them at conferences. Some of the principals are wonderful people. They basically talk about technology like it's their daughter or son, or we've got a whiz kid in the office. I mean, they just kind of delegate this stuff and they just assume everything's going to work. And I mean, there's, I mean, we're talking massive changes, both on a privacy and consent basis that have been mandated first in Europe, now in the US, and are being uh, exasperated by concerns of fraud, particularly AI fraud. I mean, it's, it is pretty, well, I mean, the word was terrifying, how these changes could impact companies, both from um, having their website flagged, non-compliance to emails as well. So what is kind of your reaction here? Well, you know, I think it... <laughs> I'll give you a plug here right now. I think it's it's forms like this to get the word out that's going to help us all throughout this uh, process. And the reality is the whole idea of privacy and flagging emails, it's not like this is, it just happened. We are going through kind of a tsunami right now, but it's been it's been coming along for quite some time. I mean, I remember several years back where we were flagged and we had to change uh, our texting platform and the whole bit. So it's about being quick to adapt. It's about uh, learning along the way through platforms like this, how we have to change it and do a better job. So Scott, see, I mean, you've been in the industry for a while as well. You've seen a couple pretty bad situations. Uh, one was when the housing market melted down um, and uh, there was a huge amount of job loss, 2008, 2009, 2010 were really brutal times for the industry. There was COVID where states were shut down, no income, actually income was reversing, cancellations left and right. And now we face 2024 with all of these challenges, not to mention the headwinds, and yet all of our uh, staff and salary costs have skyrocketed due to employment shortages. Um, how, how concerned are you in terms of some of these smaller companies or even trying to manage a company like VTrips at this point with all these variables that are not, there's not a whole lot of positive uh, news here? Yeah, to me, the, the biggest struggle is, you know, the unknown. So I think what we continue to do day after day is just uh, prepare for that, right? We don't know what's going to change or what's happening. I mean, you, there's a lot of different, you know, headwinds within the industry, but also just, you know, with the elections coming up, all the different uh, things that are happening out there, the changes in our our industry as far as uh, what these OTAs are doing, what, you know, Amber just alluded to, there just seems to be a, a, a huge chasm of things that are attacking us all at once. So to me, it's trying to understand the future, being prepared for it, 
I mean, we spent a lot of time talking about what what do we want to have ready for tomorrow and not so much to, for today. I think, the, you know, with with uh, times like this, there is that turning point, too, and tipping point, I think, for a lot of companies. So as we go through the summer, I think a lot of the companies will have to make some decisions on what it's going to be like in the second half of the year and third and fourth quarter and what they want to do to uh, if they can withstand that storm. So I think there may be opportunity for some growth in some companies based on that. So I think it's about, you know, kind of preparing yourself for where you're at today, but really looking at what's coming up and being more prepared for that. That's kind of where we're focusing our attention today. So Scott Buns, um, I heard someone, I think they were at Air DNA and, and they were trying to spin that the second half of the year was was going to improve. And when it came to me, I said, I don't know how you can say the second half of the year is going to improve because we have an election and the election is probably going to be an election that's very negative with a lot of negative ads. And typically when people are afraid, they stop spending, which is not good when you're in a travel business and you want people to stay. Um, so I'm not sure we can rest on the fact that the second half of 2024 is going to be better. But it, uh is there anything that gives you hope other than the fact that you will you can weather the storm better than other companies that are smaller? Um, is there anything here that, that's giving you hope that things might get better, uh, at least in 2024? Maybe you're just looking at 2025 and going, 2020 just a bad year and we just got to batten down the hatches. You know, I've heard the happy talk before, right? And so we, I've heard everything is going to get back to 2019, and and now it's oops, we're below 2019 as an industry. So I I don't I don't buy the second half of the year happy talk that anybody is is trying to blow out. I do look at my booking pace, and and the booking pace for us is fairly good. But uh, here's the one thing that I would say that's good news: when when things get really bad. I think maybe like Amber suggested, people still need to break away and, and take. And they probably have blown through the, the big cruise dollars, the big European travel. But, you know, we, we've got the headwinds of legal uh, government overreach where they're going to, you know, control the number of people in a unit and they're going to, you know, cut things off. Uh, What's going to really happen, I think, is there's been this explosion with a positive economy and what we had uh, with with buying real estate. I think people that have come in, decided they were going to self-manage, they're going to start to trickle out. And so if you can maintain and get through this period where the, the pretenders start to uh, go away and what's left are the professional management companies... I think that's the light at the end of the tunnel, not the I hope the second half of the year looks better. I don't buy that. So, Scott, see, that was a pretty good answer, right? So the the response is um, supply from 2019 to 2024 has increased at least 35 percent in most resort markets, maybe more. And it's somewhat different based on the markets. You know, Pigeon Forge, Gallenberg had a lot of inventory. Um, it's we can debate whether inventory in Kodak is is Knoxville or Gallenberg as it's being advertised on Airbnb. But what Scott Bunce is saying is, look, there's a lot of opportunity here in organic pickup uh, and even potential distressed companies. I mean, I had my first contact over last weekend with a company that might be in cash flow issues, um, companies that are going to be upside down with trust accounts. Um, you know, there will be some consolidation. Um, is that what you think will happen is, you know, the companies that are well run will get bigger by just gutting it out and using best practices? Well, I think the big companies, and as I was alluding to, you got to be prepared, right? So it's going to happen. I think we've seen this enough uh, in the industry. You know, as you said, we've lived through different different downturns and oil spills and all kinds of things that have happened, right, that will we'll kind of shift where that all goes. And I think we had a lot of people that bought into this market. I think we had a lot of real estate people that tried to, you know, get back into uh, uh, doing some vacation rental on the side. I think I'm starting to already see some of those falter and fail. I think with the changes with what we're seeing on the OTAs, if they all move to that, they're going to be the merchant of record. It really kills cash flow for a lot of these companies that use the 
you know, their, their trust accounting uh, for those off months that they won't be able to. I think all those things will play out. They'll try to get through the summer, depending on how that goes. Um, but I think, as you you know, the summer has kind of, uh, you know, crushed itself down. It's about six weeks now, uh, six or seven weeks, and there's not that much summer. Kids are going back to school earlier, and it, it's been consolidated. So I think all those things will set up some opportunities for all of us at the, that are still here at the end of the summer and the in the fall, and people will be looking for some some other way to get out. Uh, I, don't, I don't think the valuations have uh, been supportive of that, so I think those will be lower as well. So people aren't going to be looking for you know seven eight times uh, any EBITDA. There'll be different you know different challenges for them and just trying to make cash flow. So I think there definitely will be some opportunities on, on all those fronts going forward. So Amber, I forgot about BP Oil. Uh, boy, I guess uh, I wasn't in Destin at that time, but you were right in the middle of it. Uh, but not to get too far off because I don't want to make light of an oil spill. Uh, but we, I, I mean, it is a lot of, you called it, um, change, right? So there's a lot of change coming in this industry, some of it pretty significant. And unfortunately, a lot of the forums where those changes were, um, you know, educational, like the VRMA used to be in terms of having um, top speakers who actually had knowledge, as opposed to someone with 10 homes speaking at the podium, Um but I'm just curious, Amber, what what would you say on a positive front um, to people who are out there and they're concerned and, you know, they not sure what to do at this point? Um, would you tell them to contact their technology partner and, and put something in writing? Would they put something in writing? I mean, what, what do you tell these people if they're like, hey, I'm on X software system. I have no idea if any of this stuff or I'm using a web marketing company. I have no idea. What do you what do you tell these people? Well, Steve, you used to let me help them in general, but now you said I can't. So that's part of the problem. But uh, to be honest, I do think some of us old folks that have been around for you know twenty five plus years doing this, we've weathered so many storms that we have a lot of hope for the future. I don't feel like everything is doom and gloom. It's painful. It's exhausting right now. But I think um, my best advice is one of the biggest failures of companies or leaders is if you think what you've been doing is what you need to do going forward and that's the recipe for success, you're going to fail. So you need to look at everything you think is right and what has made you successful and rethink it because the world is changing very quickly. And so I would think being open to change, being flexible, realizing that maybe you got all of your revenue from this one fee before doesn't mean that that's how you're going to get it moving forward and really just rethinking your entire playbook. You know, I do think that um, asking, you know, finding articles like that and asking your, your technology companies, like, what are we doing and what does this mean um, is, is also a key part of it and how are we prepared for it? Um, But I think that, you know, the way I figured it out and the way we're prepared is a tremendous amount of reading. So keeping up and and really giving it the time, because I think we have felt insulated from a lot of these changes. A lot of people think, oh, this privacy stuff is Europe. A lot more companies uh, are are actually liable under CCPA. And California has three privacy laws, CCPA and CPRA, which just rolled out, and another one. And a lot of companies are liable under that law that have nothing to do with California, and they don't realize it. So I think just... Uh, doing your due diligence, but I think we're all going to be fine. It's going to, I think the companies that are probably at the most risk are the ones that started during the COVID boom because they haven't, they don't know, they don't have the scars. They don't have the calluses on their hands uh, from the hurricanes, oil spills, 9-11, like all the things that the rest of us have survived through that are left. I mean, a lot of the people that have, you know, weathered through a lot of those things have retired or been bought out. So it, it really is a different industry when you look out in the crowd now. Well, on that note, um, I will say some element of optimism from, from Amber. I think it's, if you are willing to put in the effort to evolve, uh, you'll survive, uh, but also be careful of who you're listening to. I'm not sure 
I'd run over to the short-term rental wealth builder conference in Nashville and listen to their advice because a lot of those people are not going to make it. I saw a LinkedIn post about someone bragging that he only markets on Airbnb and VRBO and direct uh, website is a waste of time and money. Uh, and there were like 90 comments. Some of them were like thumbs up supporting him. Those people aren't going to make it. Um, you know, you have to have one, as we've all talked about, a diversified strategy. You have to have diversity with your OTAs. You can't just be on one. You got to be on all of them. You have to push them to have monthly meetings, quarterly executive reviews. You have to work with them on promotions and promotional calendar and promotional events. I mean, you have to put the work in with the OTAs if you're going to get the best out of them. And on your direct site, you can't just abdicate it to a web marketing company. Um, you can't just abdicate emails um, to the web marketing company either. You've got to be hands-on and you've got to be on this stuff and you've got to be asking them questions. And by the way, if you are going to go to a conference like VRMA, uh, you know, make sure you hit every web marketing vendor and send them an email and ask them you know, about these privacy and spam and fraud policies that are going to impact Chrome and Gmail and Yahoo and all these other things and find out what kind of response you get. Because if your company that you're dealing with doesn't have a response or doesn't want to provide you a response, chances are they probably have some big time problems. So if you're going to spend the money to go to these conferences and go to the vendor room, uh, use it as a chance to educate yourself. But on that note, we're at the end of another uh, episode of Straight Fire VR. Appreciate everyone being on. You can go to www.straightfirevr.com to see previous episodes. Thank you, everyone.